Good morning. It's uh, a joy to be here to minister God's word. Um, unlikely heroes. Um, I so enjoyed Cass's message on Leah. Wasn't that something a couple of weeks ago? If you didn't get it, um, download it. And then last Sunday I was ministering at Hope Central Church, one of our CRC churches, wonderful church. Those who know Joe Habermill, he was our youth leader here. And we commissioned him from here in, 19, in 2000 or 1999. A little group started as an ethnic church, about 30 people. Uh, they now have 700 people, two campuses, and they're ready to start a third. So they're moving forward, and it was just, just terrific to be there, really, uh, really uh, exciting. So um, it's great, and Joe, of course, is part of our CRC movement, so I do visit some of our key CRC churches in my role as national leader, uh, though I focus on our Christian Family Centre churches, obviously. Um, but uh, Cass's message was brilliant. Last week, Adrian, I, I was away, but I got it on... I got it. We had a few technical problems this week, but I finally got it and watched it. It was pretty ordinary, wasn't it? <laughs> Where is that Adrian? I'm seeing him today. I've got to fix him up a bit. That one. No, it, was a, it was an amazing message. And uh, Adrian shared with us about Joseph and his foibles and, uh, and the lessons that are relevant to us. And as we think of him, have you noticed there are 13 chapters on Joseph but nowhere near as many on Abraham, his great-granddad, or nowhere near as many as on Isaac, his grandfather, or his dad, Jacob. So the book of Genesis finishes up focusing on this magnificent man. Book of Genesis, the first 11 chapters, gives you a big telescopic view of God, the universe, creation, man, how sin came into the world, the flood, big picture stuff about origins, beginnings. No details, just gives you, doesn't tell you how he made the heavens and he just made it, he was there. Uh, and then he focuses in microscopically on one man, Abraham, from chapter 11, his son Isaac, his son Jacob became Israel, the father of the 12, and then one of the boys, Joseph, and the others that are there, the other boys that caused Joseph a lot of grief. So because God's plan, as we see from the beginnings, is there's a problem with humanity. We lost our way. We went our own way. Eden was meant to be heaven on earth. Earth was meant to be, he earth was meant to be beautiful and wonderful and sin-free, but we went our own way. And so God had to find a way by which he could forgive humanity and yet remain perfectly just because the soul that sins had to die. The death penalty was upon the whole human race. And so love and justice found a way. And he said, I'll find a way. And the way he came up with it, I'll come to earth myself. I'll visit this planet and I'm going to rescue them. And I'm going to reveal myself as a human being. And the son, the eternal son, chose to come. And Jesus of Nazareth became, came and, and carried the sin of the world and, and bridged that separation between perfection and imperfection, between sinfulness and sinlessness between frailty and fabulous character. And so, uh, but he had to find a way. So he had to have a human lineage. So he chose Abraham. And, uh, and so this line, Abraham, Isaac, all the way through to Jesus. And Matthew records that. Luke and Matthew record the genealogies. And uh, so it was through this one person. And so the storyline here is actually all about Jesus. So you might think it's just history. It's, it's, it sort of is historical. It's fantastic. In fact, the stories are, are so moving. But 13 chapters on this one guy, Joseph. Why, I ask myself, is there more written about Joseph than about his dad and, 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 and granddad and great-granddad? You know why? Because he is so like Jesus. Their likenesses are just compelling. As I'm reading the story again, so I read it through two or three times this week, I just went through the whole of Genesis and I checked out some notes and just to refresh myself, I know the story's pretty well, just to refresh myself, so, and I thought, you know what? He reveals Jesus more than 
his dad and granddad and great-granddad. No wonder they spent so many chapters here. And, and nobody could make this up. Um, so the descent of, of... It's like you read Philippians chapter 2 about Jesus, how he left heaven, the condescension and the ascension. Condescension, come to earth, death on a cross, crucifixion, atonement, and then he gets resurrected, ascension. It's a bit like with Joseph, like his descent is incredible and and last week you got to i laughed when i at times when when uh, adrian shared i thought man that's he gave me some insights see joseph is favored and spoiled by his dad now parents how many of your parents here grandparents okay let me give you a little life lesson here from this read the story you may not be able to change your feelings towards that one child that you connect with better and we all have that. But you can change your actions towards your other kids. Don't play favourites. Love and accept them all. And if there are particular feelings you have towards one child because you connect better, keep it to yourself. Between you and God, do not favour. You read what, what Jacob and Israel and Rachel did to their kids. It was terrible. It was not good. There's a lesson there. Hey, he he then gets rejected and betrayed by his brothers. The lesson I see there is if you've been blessed by God with certain abilities and talents, don't brag about them. Just be thankful to Jesus. Keep your mouth shut. Control your mind. Keep it to yourself. Don't tell other people. Let them affirm you rather than you having to affirm yourself. Because you affirm yourself, you're actually putting down other people. You're saying, well, aren't I more intelligent? Aren't I a better sportsman? Aren't I a better... Ah, don't. If God has blessed you with certain gifts and abilities, just thank Jesus, don't brag. That's a good maxim for life, isn't it? And because I tell you, jealousy can turn you into a killer. The brothers... Their deep jealousy that Joseph unwittingly was pouring kind of accelerants on and the fire kept on going, the brother's deep jealousy had grown to an ugly rage and it completely blinded them to what was right. The time to deal with jealousy is when you notice yourself keeping score about what others have. Are you keeping score about what others have? Deal with it. Otherwise, that takes root and you don't know where that's going to end up in your interpersonal relationships. Joseph gets falsely accused and punished by his masters, <laughs> like Mr. and Mrs. Potiphar, Captain Potiphar of the Pharaoh's guard. And what's most shocking about what happened with Mrs. Potiphar is that he gets punished harshly for doing what's right. He didn't get punished for doing the wrong thing. Like with his brothers, you can understand, well, Joseph, you're a young, immature boy. It's not right what the brothers did, but there's a kind of, mm, you know, just don't go there. Jealousy can make you a killer. And stop inflaming those older brothers of yours by your bragging. But he's doing the right thing. He's actually serving Captain Potiphar as a slave for 11 years. He's 17 when he arrives. Now he's 20, 28 when he leaves Captain Potiphar's house. So he is serving, he is serving, he is serving. And I don't think, I mean, you read the story and you think, oh, well, he's a young boy and and Mrs. Potiphar wants to do the wrong thing with him. He's only a kid. It's when he's an adult. It's when he grows up into this handsome, magnificent, handsome, with a fantastic body. One like I had when I was in my 20s. <laughs> and I think Mrs. Potiphar, I don't think she was old and ugly. I think she was young and beautiful. And she knew it. And something's going down between Mr. Potiphar and Mrs. Potiphar. And I think Mr. knew what was up. I think any man knows if his wife's, her affections are 
elsewhere. And every wife knows if her husband's affections are elsewhere. And uh, so, anyway, so she tries to entrap him. And, uh, and he does the right thing. He doesn't do what David does. You know, King David is just stupid. He sees a beautiful looking creature. Now, he's not responsible for how beautiful she was. He just happened to be walking. He should have been at war. He's walking on top of the parapets and there she is showering and she's unbelievable. And instead of him bouncing his eyes and going, well, you know what? Thank God for women. They're beautiful. But God, thank you that you have given me my wife and I'm going to go and be with her. No, foolish David. His eyes once, second look, a third look, and then those big strong legs took him closer to the image. Can't reason with temptation. It'll get you down. Joseph, I don't know how he did it for all those years, but Mrs. Potiphar was there, he'd be over there. And so when she finally grabbed him, what did he do? Those big strong legs, he didn't sit there. Let's reason together, Mrs. Potiphar. No, he just ran away. Run from temptation. You can't reason with it. You can't flirt with it. It'll get you. And so uh, he's, he's a great guy. He's behaving well. And he gets put in prison. He's 11 years a slave. And, and so he's actually now thrown in jail. He's up, falsely accused, punished by his masters. And uh, he's no longer a narcissist. Joseph was a narcissistic little boy, self-centred, but I think that got broken. I think that got broken as he's travelling across the desert to Egypt and as 11 years as a slave uh, with Potiphar, he's changed. And you don't see the self-centred braggedness ever again in the story. So he's imprisoned and forsaken by everyone. (laughs) So, I mean, it gets worse. So he's in prison and... Pharaoh discovers some conspiracy among his aides, the cupbearer and the baker. Who knows what they were doing? Maybe they were planning a coup d'etat. Maybe they wanted to poison him. No one knows. Except he says, in jail. I'll fix you boys later. So throws them in jail. And they develop a friendship with with Joseph. And Joseph, in his interactions with them... um, talks with them and they have dreams. These guys have dreams. They're, they're nightmarish dreams. Like They don't know what's going to happen to them. Uh, there's no court of justice. It's just on the whim of Pharaoh. Off with his head or restore him back. Anyway, so they have dreams and, and this boy now is able to interpret dreams. Somehow he's drawn so close to God that he hears the voice of God. And so to draw close to God and to be able to hear the voice of God, he would have had to let go of resentment and bitterness and all those blockages. So you don't, get, you don't see him praying and drawing close to God when he's, uh, with his brothers. He's just brag, he's, he's a braggart and he knows he's gifted and he's telling everyone about them. But now he's a different boy. Anyway, the, the baker, he tells him what's going to happen and Pharaoh executes the baker. But the cupbearer gets restored and and Joseph goes Mr. Cupbearer remember me don't forget me you know like I told you what you know what's gonna happen all that stuff so they go yeah 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 I'll do that he forgets about him so Joseph helps this guy to get out of prison and then the guy says I'm gonna help you and he forgets about him incredible He's forgotten by the man he helped anyway Pharaoh has a dream and nobody can interpret it Weird dream. But it's about the future famine and restoration and uh, of ha- how to save the country and save the world, basically. It's a dream. And all of his soothsayers and diviners, they can't interpret it. They're useless. They're occult powers. They can't do it. And then the cupbearer goes, oh, 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 just remember. Oh, that boy back there. Oh, I forgot about him. So he says, there's a guy in the prison. He can interpret dreams. They bring him up and he interprets the dream of Pharaoh and everything changes. But think of this kid. From 17 till 28 years of age or so, he's in prison. He's a slave. And that can make you a bitter person or it can make you a better person. It depends on how you handle it. So this is the ascent. His ascent. He's transformed by his terrible suffering. 
No question about that. He gets transformed. This self-assured, overconfident young man, he gets totally transformed by pain and suffering. Think about it. He's rejected, though he's rejected, betrayed, slandered, falsely accused, unjustly imprisoned. He doesn't give in to self-pity or seething resentment. Interesting. He never asks the question, why? You never hear him wallowing into self-pity and going, woe is me, or why is this happening to me? In fact, what you see in him, he goes, well, God, what are we going to do about this? It's like, what's the next step, Lord? Like he's, he hasn't got room in his life to wallow about himself. The narcissism, the self-absorption is broken. He's now God-focused and he's thinking of other people who are less fortunate than him. What an amazing transformation. And yet he's been, all the stuff that's happened to him. I was talking to somebody from the 8.30 service in, in the, the coffee lounge and, uh, um, and they're new to the church, they shared a little bit of the story. And I said, man, I said, pretty bad what's happened. I said, is it worse than what happened to Joseph? She goes, nah. I said, it's a lesson there, isn't it? I said, the good's going to come out of it. The application, I mean, how many of you have gone through worse things than Joseph? Oh, I don't think there'll be too many of you here. And so the, this 13 years of enslavement and imprisonment, Joseph becomes a beautiful soul. He's, there's no bitterness, there's no questioning why. It, it's just like there's no vengeance in his spirit. He evolves into a 30-year-old mature man whose heart is now God-centered and not self-centered and he's got an attitude towards love, towards others, even his enemies who have caused him such great pain. You would think a little bit of resentment, a little bit of payback. When the opportunity comes, am I going to give it to Mrs. Potiphar? I wonder what happened to Mrs. Potiphar when he became Prime Minister of Egypt. I wonder what happened to her. I wonder what she was thinking. I wonder what he did. I think we know what he did. He forgave her. And his spirit of kindness and, and, and sense of, of appropriateness, there was no vengeance to pay back those who had caused him ill. And that caused him a lot of trouble. And so Joseph actually gets promoted because of his great example. His inner heart transformation by God through suffering and pain, shows itself in his outward behaviour and actions. His integrity gets Potiphar's and the warden's attention. They notice him. He stands out like a neon light. This kid is different. He becomes overseer of his master's house and of the warden's prison. So initially he's rotten in this jail, but the warden puts him in, in his own house to take charge of the prison. I've got a sneaky feeling that Mr. Potiphar must have whispered something in the warden's ear and says, you know what? He didn't tell him that he doubts his wife's integrity, which I think he probably did. I think he whispered something in his ear and said, look after him. He's actually a good kid. And because very quickly he's running the prison. I mean, like within weeks. He's only in prison for two years. Like he's actually running the prison. So I think that, that his outstanding qualities uh, are, are revealed in, in his day-to-day activities where he's working what he's doing he determined to be the best slave he determined to be the best prisoner possible and he did his duty with such a great attitude that God used it to outwork his sovereign purposes now we can say hey it's all of God God had a plan God had a purpose true but he could have blocked that purpose he could have ended up in seething resentment and bitterness, had a sword in his hand, and he could have committed more crimes to pay back, but he didn't do it. So God used this pain and suffering, he didn't cause it, he used it to transform this boy and, and made him into a, a magnificent person, a Jesus-like figure who saves the world. He actually saves the world. Amazing. Ah, oh, Jesus. <laughs> so, have a look at these scriptures. The Lord was with Joseph, Genesis 39, so that he prospered and he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. Verse 21, the Lord was with him. He showed him kindness and granted him favour in the eyes of the prison warden. 
So he could have blocked the working of God. That's what I'm saying. And so it's the age-old argument to say, well, you know, predetermined nation, the, the sovereignty of God and the human freedom and human will, how does it work together? They both work together. I think he could have blocked the activity of God. I think God's purposes would have been outworked through somebody else if he didn't comply, if he didn't flow, if he became bitter, angry, hateful, and became a killer himself like his brothers. So, hey, lesson here for us, to follow his example by doing our very best, church family, in every task we find ourselves doing, even the smallest ones we're asked to undertake, whether at work or whether here at church. He became a nice and likeable person. And that's the key to good relationships and how to get promoted. This is how you get people's attention, by being nice and being likeable. Okay, you might be gifted, but if they don't like you, you ain't going to get promoted. You may be less gifted than the other Charlie, but he's horrible. He's not a nice person. Well, I think they're going to select you. So be nice in Jesus. Be likeable. And uh, <laughs> you'll get their attention. I, 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 you know, in your marriage, seriously, just be nice to your wife. Be nice to your husband. Be considerate in the little things, not just the big things. Um, for your kids, for your grandkids, just be nice. Write them love letters. Send them some money. And all the grandkids said, yes, please, more. <laughs> and just bless them. Like little Josiah's in Icaria. This is Nikki's little boy. They're, they're over in my home island. And I'm trying to get through to him that when I go overseas, I buy them a present. Well, Kathy <laughs> buys the present in my name. Yes, she... <laughs> so he's got it in his head that when he comes back, we're going to give him a present. Uh, I'm saying, Joey, I said, no, you're in holidays. You buy Bubble and Yaya a present. He doesn't get it. Like, so I said to Kat, I said, sweetheart, just get them presents and give it to them when they arrive. <laughs> They're children, you know, like. If you're nice, if you're likeable, you'll go places. I remember as a kid, as, as I'm coming to Christ, I'm, I'm 15, 16, and I'm... I'm doing sport. I'm playing competitive snooker and billiards. I win the state championship under 23 years of age. I'm 15 years of age and I clean out the whole group under 23. So I'm thinking I'm going to become a professional snooker player and make a lot of money. I'm dreaming to be Ronnie O'Sullivan, the greatest cuist in the world. You've got to watch him. Check him out on YouTube. He's a freak of nature. I thought I'd get that one in. Anyway, so I'm there and there are others that were older, and the guy who ran the, the, the billiard saloon, he used to trust me with the bag of money to look after things when he'd go for a drink down the hotel. He was a bit of a gambler, a drinker, and he kind of would go for a couple of hours and say, Bill, could you look at He wouldn't, I'm only 15. He wouldn't ask the older ones who are 18, 20, 21, and it was, and it was interesting. And I thought, why? I didn't know why, but I think now, looking back, because I was trustworthy and likeable and, and was basically submitted to him. I'd, you know, I'd clean the tables as he wanted them to. You don't bang the balls on the spot. You, you do it the right way. So I was basically submissive to him and learned from the others that were there. Some of them were terrible. There were two guys in particular, I was reflecting on it this week, and uh, they, they, were, they were not nice guys. One was in his early 20s and uh, he was a bully. So psychologically, he would kind of ridicule me as a little Greek, used ethnic terms, being Greek and all that stuff, and I was really skinny, not like now, and, and so my nose really stuck out really skinny, you know, like. <laughs> so, so when I used to see his car there, you know, fear would grip my heart, because I knew I was going to cop it. And, uh, but he wasn't nice, and everyone knew, I never wanted to play with him. I used to think, uh, then there was another guy, big Tony, and he was so angry, but he'd never say anything, he'd get so angry, one day he smashed the cue on the table because I beat him. And it went flying into the wall. I thought, man. So I, I'm being terrorised by these two guys who are a lot older than me. They were not nice. They were never asked to look after the billiard saloon. They were never asked to be the captain of the team. And as I'm coming, and at the end, I, I ended up hating them, actually, as, as I thought, I don't like them. 
I, don't, I, I just dislike them. I don't even want to play with them. After I became a Christian, I had to let go of the hatred and just basically forgive them for you know, being sinners. <laughs> basically, they're sinners. They don't know Jesus. It could have been me. So, um, but as I'm coming to Christ, I'm going through this event. But I, I was reflecting back and thinking, I wonder why Jack Harris, the, the, the owner, uh, always would call on me ring me up, you know, Bill, could you come and look after the saloon? And I'm only a kid. He didn't know whether I, I could have stolen from him, I could have abused the trust, but I think people will notice, they will notice and they will promote you. It's not based on age or, or ability, it's based on niceness and kindness and character. And I think this guy, Joseph, he's just, everyone loves him. He is exalted by his humble spirituality. He learned from his suffering and he grew through it. That's the key. You don't hear anything else. You can learn through suffering and pain. And you can grow through it. He developed a godly character, deep wisdom, and a loving heart that was attuned to God's voice. He's repented of his self-exalting pride and he allows God to heal the hurt in his heart and to forgive his brothers the Potiphar's and the neglectful cupbearer. There's not an ounce of unforgiveness towards all those that have hurt him. Wow. Not an ounce of unforgiveness. He's a clean skin. And I think that's why in his spirit, God could, could actually just work through, because there's no, there's no blockages to, to, for God using him. And what an example for us to follow. That it's possible. You may have been abused. Or you may have abuse somebody verbally, emotionally, physically. You may have sinned against somebody. Or they may have sinned against you. We've all, we've all done the wrong thing. We're all got the mark of Cain upon us. We're all born in sin. And other people who are born in sin will sin against us. We're all in the same camp. We need Jesus Christ. We need him in our lives. We, we can't function in life. I don't know how people can function in life without him. I don't know how people can handle bereavements like Mr. Donaldson going to be with the Lord, and even though he's an older man, without the hope. You know, when we prayed together, Lynn and you guys the other week, um, we know, we knew where he was going. There's, there's, without Jesus, people don't cope. We know where our loved ones are. They're in heaven. We're going we're gonna to see them. We're going to be with them. It's real. It's more real than this life here on earth. And we need Jesus' real presence now through the Holy Spirit to tame the wild heart that we have that will lead us away to, to give in to bitterness and hatred and unforgiveness and all those horrible things, resentment that will restrict us from being truly human and functioning as God wants us to function in right relationships with him and, and with everyone else. Um, and so... Uh, How do you prepare, good question, to be raised from a prison house of darkness and despair to prime minister, the highest position in Pharaoh's kingdom? How do you prepare for that? Well, you can't. You can only position yourself by walking humbly before God and having a heart to serve those who are less fortunate than yourself. And that is Joseph. I mean, <laughs> our political system here in Australia... I mean, they're all frail men there but, and women. Oh, but dear me, striving for the number one job. I mean, like, they get the knives and go, Yee! you know, psycho, in the back. You know, whether it's, you know, prime, one stabs Mr. Rudd and, and then another one stabs Miss Gillard in the back and then they grab the knife and stab, stab. Eh, it's weird. Okay, and then there's... In the opposite, the, the government now, there was previously one, you know, the, Mr. Nelson, they stabbed him and then they stabbed him and, and it's all this fighting. It's like, there's no humility there. <laughs> it's not like positioning yourself. It's actually get the knife and stab them in the back. I really admire Paul Keating. I love it, the fact that he went out and said, you Victorian parliament are crazy. He's cut out this euthanasia. I won't use the language that he used because it's going to demean civilization. You know, Keating said about when he took over from Bob Hoy, he goes, what's all this business of stabbing people in the back? He goes, I, I grabbed my knife and stabbed Bob in the front. 
He said, I told him, well, I, need, I want your job. You're not doing a good enough thing. And he said, oh, I'm keeping it. Go, go, I'm going after you. And he did, with integrity. No backstabbing. He said, I want the job. I want to kick you out. You old funny daddy, you lost your way. You're going back to the booze. You're going back to the women. I don't like you anymore. Eh. I think Hawke was a good Prime Minister, in spite of his foibles. I think Keating was a good Prime Minister. I think um, uh, Howard was. But, you know, like, there was... Where you've got this ugliness of ambition and blindness and, and, and hatefulness and intrigue, you know it's unhealthy? We all feel it, don't we? We all feel it. See, in Joseph, there's none of that. None of that at all. With Joseph, he's just positioning himself by walking humbly before God having a heart to serve people, and particularly people that are less fortunate than himself. He's so careful to honour God and to give him the credit for the ability he receives from the Lord to interpret dreams. I mean, he's totally different to the braggart, painful, arrogant teenager that he was. You don't see that anymore. Only God can change that. Have a look what it says here. To, to Pharaoh, he says, I can't do it, Pharaoh. But God will give Pharaoh the answer he desires. He actually says, hey, it's God. It's not me. We too will be guarded and guided by the hands of our loving heavenly dad when we lean into him as our source. And when we trust him in spite of any adverse circumstances we go through. Joseph tells us this. He speaks of this. He becomes the saviour of his family and the world. When Joseph's brothers finally meet up with him, I mean, it's one of the most poignant and incredibly moving chapters. The chapters are just so moving. It's like, wow. And, and this guy, Joseph, he's developed a tender heart. So he's seeing his brothers, and he's got to make sure that, you know, he's got to test them. He's the prime minister. He's got to ensure that they haven't given in to sin and become spies, all that kind of stuff. And so every so often, they just, he, he, just, can't, he just runs out and bawls his eyes out. Yeah. Gets himself ready, comes back out. He's very soft in his heart. Tough-minded. Prime Minister. Organisational genius, when you read the story. But he's got a tender heart towards, towards people. And um, these men, his brothers, he has not seen them. Now it is, he is, how old is he now? 37 years of, of plenty. He was 30, 37, two years of famine. He's 39. He, they... they got rid of him when he was 17. He hasn't seen him for 22 years. So they finally come. They don't recognise him. I mean, he's got an Egyptian haircut, the bald look. You know, eye makeup, mascara, what the men used to wear in those days. Don't recommend it. <laughs> so he, they don't know who he is. But he recognises them. Do you know what he sees with them? He sees they're carrying a load of guilt. They're carrying heaps and heaps of shame. And they're so fearful. They're so fearful because if ever their daddy, Jacob, found out, he would die. Or he would curse them and cut off their inheritance and, and they, they no longer be the sons of Israel. They're carrying this for 22 years. And Joseph can see this. But just like Jesus, Joseph has a forgiving and kind and gracious heart towards these wayward brothers. And you don't see him saying, I told you so, you know, when I was 17, I had the dream and you're going to be bowing down. Well, look at you boys, you're bowing now. I'm the PM. Hey, <laughs> give me high five. <laughs> None of that. None of that. He's a grown up. He's a grown-up, he's a man. The brothers thought, when you read the whole text, for these 22 years, and even longer, even right up till Jacob's death, Joseph's death, even when they get restored, and years have passed, they still think we're going to cop it as punishment from God. They've got such a deep, deep misunderstanding of the heart of the Father. Even though Joseph forgives them 
and he's kind towards them, they still don't believe it. Isn't it interesting? They receive his kindness, they receive prosperity, they still believe when the old man dies, he's going to give it to us. He doesn't want to give it to us now because the old man might be happy, Jacob. They're carrying this, they're terrified. They have a, a conception, that they don't understand that when you're freed from your sins, you've got to actually forgive yourself. When God cancels out your sins and says, no more, I declare you're not guilty. My son took your guilt. He's actually saying, you've got to forgive yourself. You, you've, got to, you've got to get that load of anxiety and shame and throw it onto Jesus. No more shame. You can look God in the face and he does not see your past. He does not hold anything against you. He sees the worth of his son. He sees the work of his son through the cross. And we don't believe that. It's like, you know, I think that's why I wrote the book, The Me I Can Be, because that chapter on renewing our mind is so key. Because we just don't believe what God says. And the biggest problem God has with us is our believing. Deep down, profoundly. And these brothers, they're believing junk about God and about themselves. And even about their brother, Joseph, who's actually told them he's forgiven them. And so... Um, the brothers thought they were being punished by God for what they'd done to Joseph and that Joseph was going to unleash his vengeance and they were terrified. L read, let's read Joseph's Jesus-like words. Have a look at this from Genesis 45 and Genesis 50. And now do not be distressed. Because you can see that they're distressed. And do not be angry with yourselves. Stop punishing yourselves, brothers. For selling me here. Because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. Guys, get the big picture. God's in this. I found God. I'm hearing from God. I understand his plan and purpose. What you did was wrong, sure. But God is bigger than your wrong. He's bigger than your sin. He's bigger than your callousness. And I see God in this. And they're, 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 they don't quite... So they're distressed and they're angry. Then, But God sent me ahead of you, verse 7... To preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. He goes, there's got to be the house of Israel. There's got to be a remnant because the Messiah's got to be born through this remnant. Interestingly, it's through Judah. Now, Judah's a scumbag. He is not a nice boy. Read the chapters on, on Judah. It's like you think, and yet God chose Judah to be the line that the Messiah was born. What? You know, at the end, Judah got saved. At the end, he offers his life as a sacrifice. He says, take me. He's a Christ-like figure too. He goes, take me. Even if I have to die for my little brother, Benjamin, because I can't handle how my daddy's going to handle it. I've seen him in pain for all these decades. And now, Prime Minister, Joseph, you're going to take, you're going to take my, my little brother, my half-brother. It'll kill my dad. And he offers his life. Wow, this proud, arrogant, licentious man found God in the process. And that's why I think Jacob, when he blessed him, he says, you're the one. Judah, you're the one. The line's going to come through you. Interesting. Unlikely heroes. The whole story, this cracked family, how God uses them and saves them. But have a look at this. So, so now, verse 8, it was not you who sent me here, but God. Boys, you didn't send me here. I know you were up to no good. And I know you had murder in your heart. But look, God overruled. Then Genesis 50, after Jacob dies, this is after Jacob or Israel dies, this is years later, they're still uncertain of Joseph's intentions. But Joseph said to them, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. And look at this. This is just like Jesus. So don't be afraid. How many times did Jesus say, do not fear. I will provide for you and your children and be reassured. And he reassured them and he spoke kindly to them. That's how Jesus treats us. Stop punishing yourself. Stop being hard on yourself. This is what Jesus was, is saying and doing. He's saying, hey, hey, don't be afraid anymore. Don't let your past sins terrorise you. Get rid of that shame. Stop being fearful. You, you, you're assured of heaven. 
and uh, your sins are forgiven. You've, you've repented, you've, you've, you've made restitution as far as possible. I will provide for you and your children. And he reassured them and he spoke kindly to them. Now have a look at this chart about how Joseph foreshadows Jesus, the saviour of the world. It's really interesting. Verses from Genesis, and then I've taken verses from the New Testament. He's beloved. They're both beloved by their fathers. We know, of course, with uh, Joseph that it became a, uh, an extreme. They were sent by their fathers to their brothers. They were hated by their brothers without a cause. They were severely tempted. They were both taken to Egypt. They were stripped of their robes. And interesting, Jesus' robe was an expensive robe. People don't realise that. That's why they didn't want to cut it up. That's why they cast dice for it. It was a beautiful robe. Probably provided by some of the rich women that, were, that bankrolled the ministry of Jesus. You read Luke 8. Women that were healed and delivered had the, about 25 people on this team for, 30, for three and a half years. They needed food, lodging, clothing. They bankrolled him. Really grateful, rich women who said, we want to serve Jesus this way. So he had a beautiful robe, Jesus did. And that's why they didn't want to cut it up. That's what the soldiers said, we're going to cut this up, we're going to gamble for it. Interesting. Sold for the price of a slave. Both were sold for 20, 30 pieces of silver. They remained silent and offered no defence. They are falsely accused. Respected by their jailers. Replaced with two prisoners, one of which was later lost, the other saved. Interesting. Both around 30 at the beginning of their ministry. Both highly exalted after their sufferings. Both took non-Jewish brides. Kathy read that. She goes, no, he didn't. I said, yeah, he married me. <laughs> and he married you. We're his bride. One of the beautiful images. I love the body image. It's all about functionality. The book I'm writing, The Church Week, can be I talk about the bride and body and army image and, and that. But uh, I love the bride image because there's no way to get away from it. Bridegroom and bride. Love, intimacy, union, just deep fellowship. Knowledge of one another that's unique. Army, great, doing stuff. Body, functionality, but bride. He uses that image. He says, I want to marry you. I want to marry you. I, I, I want to be closer than a brother. There's going to be intimacy and love and relationship and care and support right through to the very end. Beautiful. Both forgave and restored their repentant brothers. Both were honoured by all earthly nations. Isn't it interesting? He foreshadows Jesus in such amazing ways. Nobody could make the story up. The fingerprints of God are all over it. To speak to us and say, here's a guy that you can emulate because he's like Jesus. See, Joseph's brothers had wanted to get rid of him, but God even used their evil actions to fulfill his plan. God had a clear purpose to work through the brothers' thoughtless acts, their cruelty. God hates thoughtlessness and cruelty, but he will work through it. God is absolutely sovereign over your life. He is. And his plans cannot be thwarted by human actions and least of all by malignant devils that will try and stop his plans being outworked. Romans 8.28 says this, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. Not all things are good. A lot of things are just plain horrible and evil. But for those who are called, and you are called according to his purpose, and you love him, he's going to work through that difficult time and make you a better person. He's going to transform you like, like he did Joseph. And, and Paul goes on to say, he goes, and I'm convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Isn't that something? Wow. Is the word of God washing over you this morning? Are you picking up something of the heart of Jesus towards you? Do you see yourself in the brothers? Some of you do. Are you carrying guilt and shame and fear needlessly? Do you need to put it at the foot of the cross and say, you know what? No, no more. 
no more. I just think I understand grace and forgiveness and the new creation better through the story of Joseph. Some of you haven't given your lives to him. And it's time to sign up. His signature on the contract is signed in his blood. It's called a new covenant. And it's irrevocable. You enter that covenant of grace and forgiveness and kindness and blessing. You'll be saved for eternity. And you'll be safe here in this life. And he will help you no matter what situations you're going to face. Maybe with what you've already faced, he's going to help you through this as the brothers needed help. And I think Joseph, the Jesus figure, I think he brings healing into those boys' hearts. And they're carrying stuff for 22 years. They're older men. They're a lot older than him. They've been carrying stuff, carrying baggage unnecessarily. But they needed a Jesus-like figure to identify the baggage. He says, you've got to stop the fear. You've got to stop beating yourself up. You've got to let God be God in your life. Can you say amen to that? Let's stand together.